Hey everyone, this is uh, Himang and today I have with me Ramit Tandon. Ramit is India's number two ranked squash player. He's ranked number three in Asia and number 36 in the world. He has won a bronze medal in the 2018 Asian Games and several other international events. Most definitely, he's one of India's finest squash players in the country. We are connecting with him a day before he departs for his training camp on his way to the Commonwealth Games 2022. Uh, Ramit is also a business professional, but today's discussion will be focused on his squash journey. Ramit, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Himang, for, for adjusting around my schedule. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm on the verge of traveling and I'm tied up with a bunch of things. So thank you for accommodating. Thank you. So Ramit, how's the prep going? Uh, it's going all right. Uh, I feel, uh, you know, we, we still have a couple of weeks uh, up to the games. Um, I've had a good, uh, good, intense week, this being the weekend. So it's kind of coming to an end of, of a hard training week. Um, I have another hard block coming up and then we'll taper towards the games. So as of now, it's been, it's been all right. But uh, uh, obviously, uh, the closer we get to the tournament, the more precise we have to be with our training. So I'm excited for the next uh, couple of weeks. So can you give us a bit of an insight into what do these preps before the competition actually look like? Because there's a part of, I guess you have to ideally peak in your game during the competition time, but you also have to make sure you're in a rhythm, right? You're, you're a working professional, so I'm not sure how much squash time you get you know, during your everyday life. Right. So what do these you know, two weeks or three weeks of camp look like? I mean, uh, it, it depends. You know, I, I think as you mentioned, right, most people talk about a uh, training block where you kind of do a lot of physical work and then there's, you know, as we move, the, the idea is to peak. Uh, and when you say peak, it is like your body should be, uh, it should have had the volume of training required for you to play to the best of your ability, ensuring that you haven't fatigued or you aren't so tired that your tournament week, you're still recovering from that volume of training. So. Ideally, when you balance that right, where you put in the volume of work and you have enough rest that you don't feel the effects of it in the tournament, but you still benefit from the work, that's what we uh, call peaking. Uh, but of course, it gets challenging, you know, when, when it comes to training, especially at our level, it is, it is a little more scientific than that. We kind of need to figure out, you know, for me, for example, like my last event was two weeks ago. So I haven't really had, uh, you know, like, a six week or eight week time period to, to start off off season training like our, our uh, PSA which is the professional squash association our season kind of ended two weeks ago and uh, because the Commonwealth Games is coming up we are like pushing towards the Commonwealth Games now so I feel it, it depends on on how much time you have in between normally I feel you we take five five to seven days of the taper week and depending on how many weeks of work you have put in those other weeks we kind of call training blocks where we can put in more volume of work because we have time, enough time for our body to recover before the competition. And how much of this training also focuses on the mental aspects of the game? I mean, see, everything is mental. You know, a lot of people tell me things about oh, separate the mental from the physical and stuff like that. I think. Uh, the the minute we wake up or maybe even when we are asleep uh, our mind space is working right there, there is no stopping the mental so so mentally even training you know when you go through hard training blocks you're pushing yourself and and that comes from from the mind you know so as as you prepare yourself physically you go through situations in your training where it is a battle is you versus you you know your mind is telling you you can't do it or your body is telling you you can't do it and your mind has to convince your body that you can do it and you've got to overcome that. And that itself, I, I feel, is is mental training. Apart from that, obviously, we do a lot of meditation work and, and we, we work with mental trainers and stuff on, on a regular day-to-day -day basis. So that goes along with it. But obviously, uh, for me, actually, the most practical component of mental training is its practical use, you know, because when I'm on the court in the match, I'm not going to have my mental trainer call me up and tell me, do this, you know. it's 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 And that's when the devils come, you know. You, you, the devils come when you're in that situation on your own and you're facing fear or you're facing fatigue or you're facing the problem, right? Like in a relaxed environment, you don't really, you're more rational about it. It's only in the stressed environment, which is a mad situation, you, you face those problems. So I feel uh, 
the the mental thing is something it's 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 everyone trains mentally no matter what job you do it 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 is the battle when you're having a battle with yourself whether you should do something or not or this is the right thing to do that's where i believe your mental mental mindset is kicked in <laughs> so how do you actually prepare for that because i guess you can visualize or or have these mental exercises where you can put yourself in this situation but in an actual game that event might be very different right meaning you could feel the there's a crowd which is involved there is uh, maybe the other side has has more players more team support yes. or vice versa right so yeah uh, can you um, prepare for those kind of situations i mean as you said you know like when you work with the mental coach you will get a lot of techniques like with visualization meditation uh practicing analyzing situations which you're not comfortable with in practice putting yourself through certain things you aren't comfortable doing with to kind of overcome being not comfortable but um i i i think for me i think every individual is different we all are built differently we all are wired differently but for me i think uh, confidence is what pulls me out of those situations i feel if you have put in the work and if you have worked hard enough to know that i have put in so much work that even if things aren't going my way i can depend on the work bank is going to drive me out of trouble i think having that backup or that sense of confidence in the match can bail you out of the situation when you actually feel the stress or the anxiety so i i feel personally it comes down to confidence how well prepared you are it's like going for a exam right if you're really well prepared you might have a few bounces in the question paper but you will you will back yourself being like you know i have read the entire book five times i'm pretty confident this is the answer versus someone who's not read the book and he gets a yeah. bouncer and he's he's knocked out right he's just like oh i'm not seen this anywhere i think it's the same thing when it comes to sport right it's like if you are very well prepared you will trust yourself and there's less doubt and there's less anxiety and if you're not and if you haven't put in the work um uh, and the work it could be like strategically it could be skill wise it could be uh, fitness wise if if those competence are strong mentally you will feel fine and because you're a working professional i'm guessing that you don't get to spend as much time on squash as a full time squash player would right so so during your i guess your uh, everyday life how do you make sure that you are in a physical shape yeah uh, i mean see i have been around the sport long enough to know what i need to do uh, to to kind of uh, be at my best right i think every athlete has his own threshold some people train 4 hours a day some people 6 some people 8 um and i feel uh, for me like having been around the sport i've always had a very um busy schedule because back when i was studying in india with our board exams and our indian cbsc icsc isc right. curriculum managing a sport does get very hectic and you kind of get used to that pressure of balancing two things uh, eventually i went to college where i had the student athlete life which again is a little hectic right because you're still competing with some of the best students in the world who are just studying and you still have to take your time and and represent your college and play and train mm-hmm. every day and you 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 go through that workload and then when i entered the real world actually i i'd worked in finance for a few years before moving back to india in new york and i kind of found the real world a little easier than what i'd gone through in school and college because i was used to taking so much workload and having pulling all nighters because i have a midterm the next day and i had a squash match the previous day that when i didn't really have to balance these things i found it way easier and uh, for me as a athlete it started giving me trouble you know I, i never had time on my hands and suddenly because you you need the body needs to recover it's a big part of of nice. sport you know like i i cannot train 8 hours a day i i have to get gaps in between training i i can do two or three sessions a day but i need to give my body rest and and recovery and and because i've been through such a busy life i can't spend the rest of my time on the playstation or watching tv and and that's what led to me kind of getting involved uh so obviously it, it, it uh, at, at the end of the day you know for me I, i i don't do squash as something like okay i need to work and i need to fit this into my life the only reason i do it is because i want to be very good at it and there is that commitment to the sport and obviously uh uh my training is scheduled in such a way where it's not eating out of me as a squash player at the same time i feel that there is another effect of of pressure as you said the mental stuff you know when you're around the sport long enough you do understand 
what you need mentally as well and i feel having this business component uh gives me a bit of relief mentally because i i feel i'm not dependent on my sport so i'm less stressed i i have i have another option i'm doing other things you know it's easy to get back up after a failure because okay you go back you spend 12 hours in the office for 3 days straight and you forget about and, and so for me as an individual i prefer having that safety net you know i am not very good in situations where there is no safety net and and that's why the whole thing i've, I've kind of tied down together and and i've made it work yeah it's amazing that you can play with this freedom of sorts right that on the squash court and that relaxed state is something which you know i would guess a lot of pro players struggle with right and i guess probably for you i guess since you have to spend time in, across india working in offices traveling for work all that how much of the of this chai pakoda and all those things have creeped into the into the life right because i'm guessing as a student athlete a lot of those things were controlled that you had your diet you had full time nutritionists looking after you and all that and the office life does allow a lot of these dietary influences to creep into so how do you stay away from that and still maintain i guess a, a decent uh, squash yeah. fitness see that that definitely takes a lot of discipline uh, you know at, at the end of the day you can when you talk about office life and you talk about a life of a squash player you describe it as two different lives but for me like even when i'm in the office i am a squash player so i i have to mentally I, it's not like i will eat anything or i will i will i will snack on stuff the way people snack on things you know i i'm very careful the chair i use in the office it, it is the athlete's chair it helps me keep my body posture right So you have to be, you know, when when you do things like this, you there's a lot of effort that goes into it. Um, I'm surrounded by a very good team. Uh, our fitness coach, as you said, nutritionist, um, mental coach. So we we all on board. We know what's happening. Um, in terms of diet and stuff, I I get whatever food that I need to be eating. Um, you know, so it's, it's all managed well. You know, uh, I think the the key is time management. If if you're able to kind of schedule things in a certain way. like i mean my my team knows they won't schedule things during my training hours i've set aside these times saying that these times don't schedule anything this is my ideal time period for meetings so most of my meetings i do within that time period so uh, th- definitely there is a lot of um, scheduling and planning that goes into it but uh, once you get that right then you can kind of find the balance also i do have the flexibility since i mean i report like my dad is my boss i report directly to him so i i do have a bit of flexibility from that standpoint if i was working at a corporate it would be different because i would not have that kind of flexibility so that definitely things are slightly flexible on the work point as well uh but overall i think it's just more about time management and and uh discipline as well like you know just because i'm in the office if i'm supposed to drink a certain drink at a certain hour it's not an excuse for me to miss it i have to make sure i do get it at the office or i carry it from home or whatever it is So um so that that discipline is definitely essential here. Yeah. Oh and I'm guessing looking back back at your career I mean right now like although you are still a I mean that that's a part which amazes me that that you are a working business professional who is still I guess India's top like two players in the in the country right and you're you're able to maintain this level and I'm guessing that that probably when you were a student athlete and all that your ranking was not that high right so you must have have worked probably while you're professional to climb up this ranking ladder what did that journey look like i mean how did you have to change your game from uh, you know when you were more focused on the sport to now you're in this journey where you're dabbling in both worlds uh i mean see as i said there, there are different uh, aspects to to do things right like uh i think every phase as you mentioned the phase of student athlete now a phase of balancing things you you learn and and it's very important to learn and adapt I, i feel it's like any business right like every day is a is a learning and the businesses that are doing better or that grow over time are the ones who are actually learning from the learning if you know what i'm getting at and it's the same yeah. thing for an athlete as well i think uh experience is a big part of of it, i think it's a big asset to an athlete you know as you grow in the sport you tend to learn a lot of things that i didn't know 5 years ago that i know today um and um i i feel obviously you got to work hard and you got to put in the time and and you got to uh face your your fears on the court and you have to overcome all of that but i feel um 
uh, in general, it's just about adapting and 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 facing, looking at your weaknesses and kind of working on those things and kind of making sure by the next season you get better at it. Um, and I think that's the process for for any athlete, right? Like you just have to yeah. keep at it and um, and keep figuring out. You have to be honest to yourself to understand what actually is going wrong when you lose, and then you have to kind of discuss with your team and find solutions to your problems so that problem is not a problem the next time you're on court and has your rise in the world rankings also been like through these past few years uh i mean see i i haven't played a lot professionally because i went to college in the us um i've been representing india and i've been playing tournaments every now and then but i haven't been on the circuit competing as a full time professional um so after college, I worked in finance for three years. So those three years, I didn't really compete. I didn't really travel and play. So I have played professionally for only like two or three years, um, in which we have also had COVID. I think 2018, the last Asian Games is the time I actually started playing. And um, today we are in 2022, which is four years. And in the four years, we've lost two years to COVID. So, um, you know, age-wise, I'm slightly older in terms of um, someone who's just starting off. But... But uh, time span on the professional circuit hasn't been s as much as someone at my age would have had, right? So uh, from that standpoint, I, I think, yeah, like I have moved up. This season has been kind of a breakthrough for me from the 50s to the, to the 30s. And I think a year ago, I, I moved from like the 100s to the 50s. The year before that, I moved from the 400s to the 100s. So obviously, as you climb up higher up in the rankings, the harder it gets to kind of make those leaps because obviously the competition is tougher as you go go higher up. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it as the last few months has been like, I mean, I am at my highest ranking and it is the jump I've had, but I feel there has been growth through every phase uh, in the last couple of years that I've played. Very cool. And now, you know, to, to I guess go even higher, as an example, this Commonwealth Games that's coming up, how do you prepare for that level of competition, right? Because in India, right. you're, you're probably used to playing with certain set of players. Maybe you'll get more exposure in this training camp where I guess the right. Indian contingent will train together. Right? But how do you prepare for, for the folks who are higher ranked than you? Yeah, I mean, see, the events I play, it's, it's all the big events in the world, which is pretty much the Grand Slams. So all the guys at, at the Commonwealth Games are players you have competed with. We are playing that level of events. It's not like the Commonwealth Games is a bigger event than I've ever played before. Um, so we kind of are competing at that level. We are used to that kind of competition. So it's not going to be a surprise in terms of competition or I'm going from a local event to the Commonwealth Games. Uh, we know what to expect. We know the players. Uh, I've played matches with the top players there as well. Um, but it's more about uh, your preparation and, and ensuring that you reach the Games Peaking, as as you mentioned earlier, and and uh, that you are at the top of your game, and and you kind of, you know, found a fix to certain issues you were having, leading up to the games. So I think it, it, the challenge is more about yourself than thinking of the competition uh, or thinking of others. I think if if you have prepared to the best of your capability, and if you have worked on yourself and your weaknesses, I think that's the best you can do because your competition also is changing, right? Like. The guys are also working on things and their weaknesses two months ago is not going to be the weakness in two months. So I think you also have to respect your opponent. If you think you're smart and you're changing things in your game, he too is smart and is changing things in his game, right? So you can't yeah. fall into that trap of chasing a competition. It's good to get motivated by it and think about, okay, these are the guys I'm competing with. But at the end of the day, you're chasing your weaknesses and, and you're fighting yourself, I think. Uh, on the court, on the day you're facing your opponent, but up to then, you're competing with yourself. And I think that that is the challenge. That's so very well said, right? That it's just focus on yourself. If things are good with you internally, you you can take care of, of whatever's thrown your way. Right? right. Now, having said that, at these competitions, right, when you are when you're out there, what kind of data is available? I mean, is your strategy based on, on looking at data and figuring out that here's the best way to play this particular player or do you go look at their games and it's more of an analog thing right where it's not right that data that, hey, uh, this player right. has uh, 80 percent uh, you know of his shots are on the backhand side you know or winners and stuff like that yes so is, it, is it data driven uh, or is it observation driven 
So I am a statistics major. I just studied it back in college, but I don't use my statistics <laughs> when it comes to analyzing data for my opponents. I, I, uh, I mean, I mean, as I said, you know, like the events we play, it's it's, it's the top events, and the the see when you're talking about the top 30, 40 players in the world, it is the same players going to the same events, and we all know each other. We all know each other's games. We all know how we play. So I don't really have to sit down and and collect data. I generally know someone's strengths and someone's weaknesses. Uh, the the debate is it's not only about your opponent. You know, sometimes my opponent's weakness could be my weakness as well. And then do I play to each other's weaknesses or do I then focus on my strength? And I, I think it, it comes down to that. You know, I think it comes down to you figuring out are you confident backing your strengths in this match or you want to play to his weakness? And sometimes it's perfect for you. Your strength is his weakness and then it's a no-brainer, right? So it's more about the permutation and combination of like who you're playing, uh, how you're feeling. You know, sometimes at our level, you know, when when you say about the data and the statistics, uh, I, I I don't think uh, statistically we get the right uh, information out of of a match because if, if you analyze one player in ten matches, I think you will find different weaknesses in each match, right? Because at our level, the basic weaknesses are so so less. It's not as simple as oh hit on the back end and he's going to miss the ball right it it is it is it is deeper than that and uh, and i think on different days people will be making mistakes on different corners of the court because the weakness is not that big a weakness you know it's just inches here and there and i don't think data would be an accurate representation unless i'm recording thousand matches of the player right i feel i feel the subset is too small for us to kind of figure out exactly the weakness so it, it gets tricky that way but uh, I, I think just depending on who you play, who you are playing, and how you're feeling, you get you got to take a call on what you want to play or how you want to play, and then you have to have the adaptability on the court because sometimes, as I said, your opponent is working on things, and in his last match, something was his weakness, and he's worked very hard on it, and then I start the match, and that's actually become a strength now, and I have to adapt. So I think you have to go in thinking you're going to do something, but have that sense to know. Okay, this is now working. I need to change it up. Yeah, I know what what you say makes sense because uh, growing up, I used to watch uh, a lot of squash, especially on Doordarshan. Yes, and yeah. those days they would screen the the matches of uh, Jamshed Khan versus Jahangir Khan, like you know the right. the Pakistani duo. And it was in some sense meditative to look at them play squash because you you'll find these endless sort of like these line drives, you know, on either the backhand or the forehand. And you're like, why are they doing this thing? Why aren't they just going for winners? But right. you know, they're playing this long game for to set something up. And right. I guess at your level, you know, the setups are not easy. You, you have right. to right. get the opponent to, to a particular area and then, I guess, right. bring out that surprise somehow. Right, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it's all about inches at our level. And then finding those um, by just analyzing a few matches gets a little difficult. And every tournament players improve and they change their games. At the end of the day, you have to think of them as professionals, you know, um, who are smart enough to know where they're going wrong. And, and, and after a tournament, that's their mission, you know, to change it. And, and they do end up changing it, right? So you're not going to find the same weakness match by match, you know. Someone's weakness today, three weeks from now, would not be his weakness, you know. So if you're, if you're trying to... Analyze data, you're not going to get accurate data out of it. <laughs> it's so amazing. I mean, uh, and, and I think the why I love squash even more. Like, I used to be a tennis player, and tennis is all about seeing what's in front of you. Right? You hit a, hit a forehand or backhand, it, it goes straight. There is, and it comes back, relatively speaking, in that straight box. But squash is this multi order game, right? It can bounce off the side walls, can, can bounce off the side and the back walls, and you just have to not only react to this thing, but it can be a way for you to strategize your game. And, and I think the translation of that into real world has right. sort of, I would say it's helping me in, in my work necessarily. I wouldn't say my, my skills are due to squash. Right. But being right. trapped on the second order effects is helping, uh, helping me deal with crisis and chaos a lot better. Right. right. Like, do you find that like when you, when you go back to, I guess, your full-time work mode, do you feel that you can handle all those situations better than, let's say, the rest of the people who are your peers, not, not say, experienced folks? Right. I, I feel, I mean, see, there are definitely benefits of being an athlete in general. I feel 
confidence is something I feel like I bring into work. It's something that comes to me from the court, you know, like the amount of workload and the situations you, you face. And I mean, sports, I, I, I keep telling people all of this, uh, especially younger kids, that sport is like within the one hour of your game, you're going to feel all emotions. You're going to feel happiness when you play a point where you've executed things well. You're going to get really angry where you make silly mistakes. You're going to feel success when you're about to win. You're going to feel failure if you lose. You literally feel all the emotion that you feel in life within that one hour. And you still got to hold your head up high and walk out of the court as if nothing happened an hour before. And then sit down with your training partner and, and have a chat. And, and I feel uh, that learning in, in that one hour is basically what life does to you over a long period of time. Um, and, um, and, and that's what I, I take back to work as well. I feel uh, I don't feel the skill set you develop as an athlete in terms of what But definitely also to stick to understanding that you got to fight for for what you want when it comes to uh, accepting failure, uh, sportsmanship. Uh, th there's so many factors, uh, and for me, the other other part is through my sport, the people I meet, the people I interact with, the networking it gives me. Um, the confidence it gives me to come back to meetings, having known that I've been in meetings with these renowned people, and, and it, it gives you confidence. I think those are I take back into work, and, and similarly work as well. You know, it teaches you a lot of patience. You know, when when you're working on the deal, it, it a squash match. You go for your match, you win or lose within an hour, the result is out. But when you're working on the deal, you're you sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes months, and then you're going on and on. And um, it, it, it shows you that, that, you know, sometimes you just have to be patient with things and, and you've got to keep at it. And, and that's what I take from work back to my sport, where I feel, you know, sometimes when you're agitated about things, you've got to remember that to stay patient. And I think the people I meet at work as well, you know, um, if, if you're looking, you will always find characteristics in people which you could take and you can use um, in yourself. And I feel like I met a lot of people at work as well and they've said things to me. And, it's also funny because I'm surrounded by so many athletes that when I meet someone who's a non-athlete and get their point of view, you know, and yeah. sometimes, you know, I have a bad loss and I'm back to work. And normally I work harder after I lose because I, I take a few days off squash mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm going in for these meetings and stuff. And I meet someone and and you're feeling bad about the fact you just lost. And they're like, oh, wow, you I read about you and, and you're such a good player. And then you look at things from that perspective, you know, I might have just lost, but that does not take away everything else that I've done and it helps you. So I, I think both have their uh, advantages and disadvantages. No, certainly, Ramit. I mean, you're, the, what you're experiencing right now is rare. Like very few people will, will ever get to do that. And you have such a calm and a methodical head on top of your game. I mean, I think that's going to be your X factor, right? And, and, and yeah, truly, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's why I tell a lot of parents, you know, uh, we, we look at sport and, and you know, I, I think it's not the fault of society. I think uh, the media hasn't done enough to educate society on certain other factors of sport. It's not about, I mean, as an athlete, I want to win and I'm not going to sure. lie and say I don't care about winning or losing. Like for me, it would, I, to play the sport at this level and to keep playing it and balancing it with a career outside my sport, the only reason I do it is because I want to win and I want to achieve something. Right. I'm not doing it. So I'm not going to turn around and say it does not matter if you win or lose. But I, I feel when you look at the experience, I can talk from my own experience that I've had balancing a sport with my education or with work. I think the learning you get just being involved with something and trying to master a craft and failing or succeeding and still dealing with success and failure and picking yourself up. And, and I, I think that learning in itself is, is an education on its own. Uh, and I think that part of sport in Indian society, I feel it hasn't hit us as hard as I think it's hit some of the other societies. Um, and I feel, yeah, I, I feel that's one point I feel if the media starts highlighting, um, the parents will kind of start to understand it's not about just running. It's right. about the mindset and, and what the emotions your child goes through when he's trying to, to master that race or, or or master a certain sport and and face competition at the young age you know so tomorrow even if they are working 
in investment banking or in IT or whichever sector, they are used to facing that competition. They know how hard they must work. And I've even seen that at work, you know, like back in the US when I'm working with fellow athletes who are at jobs now, you always see that difference in discipline, the difference in work ethic. They're willing to have a few sleepless nights to get the job done because they've been there. And I feel that side of sport hasn't been highlighted. You know, we always look at it as if, oh, it's, it's just the, the formal skills that we display on television or whatever. But it's beyond that. Absolutely. And that's the entire reason for, for a lot of what I do uh, purely as passion projects, that sports has influenced so many areas. And I like to draw examples that help innovation, that help strategy. I mean, the things that you're doing on, on court, like it, they influence every part of your life. Uh, and my examples, you know, or my own examples can be from gully cricket. Uh, I right. don't have to play at, at the highest levels of sport to, to do that necessarily. But you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it's something which needs to come probably from our school system. That it's not about you just making it in the school team. Right. Play the sport because... I uh, love what you said that in, in that one hour of your play, you go through right. all the emotions and how you handle it. That's your character building, which stays for life. Right. And I was, I was reading this somewhere, I think in China or Korea, I'm, I'm not sure where. To, to test the kid's mental strength, they put him onto a sport and they want to see how long it takes to actually learn how to play the sport. Because the ones who are not mentally strong are the ones who are going to get bored and give up before they actually... For example, squash, right? If I give a six-year-old a racket and tell him I want to see you hit the ball, the mentally strong ones who decide I want to make sure I'm going to hit the ball, within a month they'll be able to strike the ball and they'll be hitting the ball and making contact and they'll learn the game. The ones who are mentally weak and stuff, after a week they get bored, oh, I can't hit the ball, this is a use useless sport and they kind of walk away from it. So that's something actually people, I think this China, they use for like a mental strength test. They, they put kids in... in kindergarten school onto a sport and see the ones that and the ones that stick to sport they have moved into the sports industry in terms of like okay these these mm -hmm. kids should be the athletes and the ones who kind of give up on the sport they're like let's move them into medicine or some other other field so oh, that's kind of test I'll, yeah I'll look at that. <laughs> i look that up it's yeah, yeah. yeah. no but the times are changing i i see uh, i have two two boys and i see the amount of sport which is Right. Being, you know, coming up and, and even the avenues, because a lot of times previously it used to be that for you to read about a particular sport, right. it had to be right. in the newspaper. Right. It had to be someone like, say, winning something or doing something for India right. Right. at the highest levels of the sport, like the Olympics or the crickets all over right. the news. Regard anyway, right. but the other games, you only read them at certain points of time. But now with role models like yourself, like right. what Neera Chopra is doing. I think the, the kids are getting these examples that, hey, we don't just have to look at one game. There are right. other things that we could do. No, definitely. I think sport right now in India is at the highest point it's ever been uh, with a lot of growth potential in the future, which is exciting for our country because I feel like we are a developing economy and like the US is already a mature economy. I think similarly, sports-wise, we are still a developing industry and as you're saying you know that the champions that are in sport in india today didn't have this kind of information that the kids today are being brought up with and they could still make it so now imagine the kids today having this much more access this much more knowledge this much more science behind sport because obviously with these champions that government is funding bringing coaches down from all over the world the next generation and the generation after that is, is only going to get better while most other countries already have those systems in place. So for them to, to grow from where they are today is going to take another big step, which I don't know what it would be. But for India, as we start putting those systems in, we'll, we'll see an automatic growth. As they say about the economy, right? It's still developing. They're going to hit maturity and, and there is a general like growing trend overall. And I feel it's the same when it comes to sport. Sure. I guess up my time, Agya. <laughs> and... <laughs> No, and I think on that note, Ramit, uh, I wish you all the very best for your competition. Uh, wish you an amazing training camp. And I really hope you, know, you are successful uh, and you come back with the medal that you want. Thank you so much, Hema. Thank you. Nice, uh, nice chatting. Thank you so much.